Psychoanalytic traits are brought clearly by Shakespeare in King Lear. The analysis will start from King Lear and his daughters to his confidant and lastly to the illegitimate son of his. To start out, King Lear splits the kingdom according to the amount of love he receives from his daughters. Goneril and Regan speak plentifully of their love to King Lear. Cordelia who is the king's favorite denies and gets banished. It gets to the point where extent that the king's rationality deteriorates that the daughter and Edmund plan for Lear's death. Psychoanalysis plays a crucial role as it unearths the secrets, concealed desires and finally the conflict that is brought about by the characters in the play. We discuss psychoanalysis based on Sigmund Freud theory and we use textual reference in the later part of our discussion. Sigmund Freud gives a deeper understanding of psychoanalysis by further explaining the causes of concealed conflicts. Freud provides three models for us to understand the importance of psychoanalysis in King Lear. Freud gives it as the inherited personality from parents. This comes out to be the reason Edmund hates Gloucester that he plans the death of his father and half-brother, Edgar. The reason behind it is that is revolves around pleasure principle and always wishes to be met immediately. On the other hand, Freud provides the ego. The ego always acts as a mediator between what's true and what is untrue. It is a part of the human personality that has neither right nor wrong. The ego operates within the reality principle. In the play, Edmund is jealous of his brother legitimacy unlike him. Edmund values possession and wealth than rather the love of family. The third piece of Freud's model is the superego that Freud called essential narcissism or self-centeredness. The superpersonality speaks to the general public and requests flawlessness of the sense of self and the beliefs of thought and conduct. It is the human still, small voice that makes us make moral judgments of what is correct and what isn't right. We attempt to act in ways that adequate to society than our own particular individual will. It seems such sentiments of disgrace, blame, and pride. The ethical principles of Elizabethan culture are surely unique in relation to our own where the celestial right of lords, as a ruler is moral commitment. There is a conflict between Lear's ethical obligations as a father and as a ruler. Now, we discuss our topic by using textual references. Capalia Khan suggests that because there are no maternal figures in King Lear, neither in that of Lear's queen, she is non-existent in the play, nor in that of his mother, he is over 80 so she is past, likely long ago, that Lear, now seeks for a love that is normally satisfied by a mothering woman. The most basic functions of a mothering figure is twofold. First to provide love and second to provide nourishment. Hence, Lear asks for the love protestations from his daughters. Note that by seeking a motherly figure he himself is playing the role of a child. Nothing a child loves more than to hear how much he or she is loved. But when a child is rebuked as Cordelia does to her child father, note how the temper flares. What we see from Lear after Cordelia's harsh words can be likened to a full-on temper tantrum to that of a child going berserk after not getting his way. The subtext of the play as well as the word that must linger in Lear's conscience is that paradoxically all-encompassing word, nothing. It must replay hauntingly in Lear's conscience where he says, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters, and Cordelia retorts simply the word, nothing. This word dominates throughout the text in numerous instances. It's interesting that the word, nothing, can mean female privates, no thing, implying the lack of male genitalia and providing a womb, hence a maternal figure. Lear's temper tantrum in the first scene serves as a rehearsal to his madness on the heath, caused by a lack of what a mother should provide, love and care. In Cordelia's case, it was what he perceived as a lack of love through rough words, in Goneril and Regan's case, it was the lack of care in denying him a place to live. The latter proves to be much more cruel, as it is a truth that different people express their love differently. Lear's madness scenes on the heath are way more penetrating than his mere frustration aimed at Kent and Cordelia. Since he freely gave away his kingdom to whom he desired by his own recognizance, he is a rebel without a cause, much like a child might rebel if they aren't loved and accepted. Regan and Goneril provide him with worthless empty protestations of love, and a false promise of care as they abandon their father. After agreeing to let him sojourn with them till the end of his days, they leave him out to the raging storm. Cordelia lacks her sister's fancy words, but unlike her conniving sisters, returns loyally to her father's side. 
She is the only sister who truly possesses love in her heart. We hear parents sometimes refer to their own rigidity as tough love, and we can term Cordelia's love tough as well, although her love proved a little too tough, as it cost both her and and her father their lives. Paradoxically, Cordelia's love proves the most tender because it was sincere. It is very important to note that there is no soliloquy of Lear in King Lear. That's why as a reader we cannot judge Lear perfectly. Because, soliloquy is very important to judge a person from psychoanalytic point of view.